Good morning and welcome to BEC Family Service. It's good to see you here today. And if you're watching online at home, a welcome to you as well. It's uh, good to see everyone who's come along. And while we're waiting on people coming in, I'm going to ask Liz McDonald just to make an announcement for us. Please, Liz, if you want to come now. Um, the creche is back on, just back on. Got three beautiful babies. Not all ever here, I think. Maybe Faith here today. Um, really need help, folks. So if you've been in the creche rotor before, come see me. If you want to go again, please, please, please. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> Phone me. Thanks, Liz. So if you can help out at the creche, uh, speak to Liz after the, the service. Julia has chosen some hymns for us this morning, and we're going to sing the first of these now. And part of the title is My Redeemer Lives. The oldest book in the Bible, perhaps, Job. Uh, there we read these words, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And we know that today. That's echoed down through the centuries, and it's given us uh, hope. Uh, and it helps to give us peace and joy in our hearts as well. So over to Julia for the first hymn. service before the Lord in prayer. I should say that it's uh, good to see some folks back who haven't been so well. They've been recuperating, David Main and uh, uh, Ray Beatty. It's good to see them with us today. And there's a number of visitors with us today as well. I haven't had a chance to meet 
all the visitors be, as they were coming into the church, but uh, a very warm welcome to you. And Alistair Fife is here to speak to us. We've enjoyed Alistair's ministry in the past, and we look forward to hearing him later on. Shall we bring the service and the people of the church and your families before the Lord in prayer? Shall we pray? Our God and gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks for the many blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus, for friends, for family, for the food and clothing that we have, for the peace we have in our own land. We give thanks for these. But above all, we give thanks for the blessings of salvation that can come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And those of us who know the Lord remember the time when we came to know him and put our trust and faith in him. And that for, for us was a, like a beginning of days, like a new birth. And we give thanks for what we have and can have and will have in the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we come before you to thank you for your blessings, we also remember our world, a world that's dark. A world where there is wars and rumours of war, where there's famine and where people are suffering. We remember particularly the situation down in the, the Ukraine and the war there. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for leaders who are wise and who seek peace. And we just pray for that situation. We pray for wherever there's famine and drought across the world. Lord, we pray that you will help in these situations, guide the age, aid agencies and governments to do the right thing. And so we pray for our world and we pray for our town. Lord, we long to see more people coming into churches. We pray for the churches in the town, particularly those who are going through times of change at present. And we pray too, Lord, for the people that we might see folks desiring to come to know the Lord and to know the blessings that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for our families. You know the situations that we have. Others might know it. But we pray for our families at this time. We give thanks for those who have been recovering, uh, Ray and David. We give thanks for seeing them here today with us. And we remember those who are still ill at this time. We remember Alan, and we remember Duncan, as he's still very ill in hospital. Lord, we seek that you will be with them. And we pray for Stuart and others, Lord, who aren't so well. We pray finally for Alistair, Lord, as he uh, comes to bring us your message today. We pray that you will be with him. You will speak through him. The words might come from you and be directed to our hearts to challenge us where necessary, to encourage us where we need encouragement, and to bring us all closer to you and to enhance our trust and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you will be with us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we've got a wee uh, message for the, the boys and girls today. There are some boys and girls with us. I need my specs to see the screen at the back, unfortunately. Now, my daughter lives in a place called Austria, quite a long distance away. And one of the times I was there, I went to a, a town close to where she lived, and I was walking down a street. It was quite an ordinary street, old houses, but really quite ordinary. But there was a front door that was really extraordinary. That was someone's front door. Now, I don't know what your front door's like. Mine is fairly ordinary, and it's made of wood. There's nothing special about it. Some folk have glass front doors, but I don't think I'd ever seen a front door quite like that. Isn't that magnificent? Uh, and there it was. And it's, it's Jesus. It's Jesus standing at the door, and he's knocking. There is a big handle. In fact, there's two handles you can see just underneath where Jesus is knocking. Now, what made the person put that there? I don't know. It's probably many, several hundred years old whether they were saying they wanted Jesus to come into their house or whether as they left in the house in the morning they, f they felt they were taking Jesus with them, I don't know. 
Um, but clearly they were saying the Lord Jesus is welcome here. I think that's what they were saying. And we want him to come into our house to help us, to make us better and to be part of our family. It's really quite a, 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 a carving that's put on the front door. But there is another picture, which I'm trying to... Uh, I don't know what's happened. The other picture has disappeared. Ah, there it is. And some of you will have seen this picture, painted over a hundred years ago by a man called Holman Hunt. And he painted a picture that's very similar, though it's hard to see because there's darkness all around. And that's supposed to represent our dark world with all the wrong things that are in it, with all the sin that's in it. And there's Jesus, and he's bringing light. He's bringing light into the world, and he's knocking on the door. But if you look at that door, it's not clean or polished. It's got loads of weeds and trees growing up. It, it hasn't been opened for a long, long while. And of course, the... Uh, and there's no handle in the door, and that was pointed out, apparently, to the painter, who said, well, the handle is on the inside. Whether he meant it to be on the inside or whether he just forgotten and said that, I don't know. But he said the handle is on the inside of the door. It's for us to open the door. And that represents the door of our heart. And Jesus is knocking, and he wants to come into our heart and bring his light into our life and bring his love into our life. Make us better people by trusting in him and by following him. The painting's called The Light of the World, and the door is very dark, isn't it? Well, let's hope our door isn't like that, that we can welcome Jesus into our hearts and into our lives and into everything that we do, and take him with us too as we go out of our house into the world around about us. Thanks very much for listening boys and girls. We're now going to sing a, a second hymn and as we sing this hymn the young people and children will go out to their various activities and it's a hymn that reminds us of our thankfulness for the Lord Jesus saving us and coming into our hearts. Julia. <laughs>
be seated. My apologies to David Stewart. I should have mentioned David in my prayer. He's finally got a date for his operation, and we hope and pray that it isn't cancelled this, this time. <laughs> Poor David has about three or four cancellations, so let's hope and pray that all goes well, David. My apologies for omitting that from, from my prayer. Well, we're going to have a, a, a thing I enjoy doing very much now, and that's to welcome someone into the church. And we're going to welcome Hector and Susan Kinnan into the, the church this morning, into membership and to fellowship with us. I think many of you will know uh, Susan and Hector. They've been attending for the last uh, few weeks. Uh, Hector is the, the, the daughter of uh, Hector Senior and Joyce, who's well known to most of us here, uh, members of this church over many years. And uh, we also uh, uh, knew, well, I knew Hector in days gone by. It, uh, we were, our paths never crossed, but we both worked together in ICI at Ardeer, and his dad worked there as well. Uh, although we never actually met, we both worked in the, the same place. Hector originates from Salkuts. Uh, and uh, but uh, as a Stephen Stoney, I'll, I'll forgive him for that, you know. But, <laughs> but no, it's good to to see them here this morning. They applied for membership a few weeks ago. Liz and I spoke to them, and we're delighted to recommend them for membership to the church. Hector used to preach the gospel in the wee gospel hall I was brought up in in, in Stevenston, and Susan comes from Elgin. And I don't really have any connections with Elgin, apart from the fact my great-grandfather was born there, but <laughs> that's as far as I can go. Hector retired from running several businesses, and he and Susan went to live in Spain for a number of years. And they've been involved in church work, both here uh, in the Spanish coast, and more latterly, uh, they've been members of Charlotte Chapel in Edinburgh when they came back to Scotland to live. And now they've moved from, Lar uh, from Edinburgh to Largs, Hector's still retired, but Susan works on as a, a dealing with children who have very special needs. Um, and that must be a very difficult uh, job to do. Both have expressed a desire to be, membership, uh, to be in membership here, and we're delighted to welcome them into the church this morning. We pray that they might be blessed by being members here, and that we might be blessed by having them here with us. So please, after the service is finished, show them the hand of friendship, and welcome them. We're going to ask them just to raise their hands, just so the folk at the front might be to turn around so you know who they are. There, there they're waving. So. <laughs> uh, so welcome to the church. It's good to, to see you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Shall we pray? Lord, we give thanks for Hector and Susan and for their past ministry and your service. As members of the church that is your body, we welcome them into our fellowship today. We pray they might be blessed by being with us and us by having them here. Lord, we extend a hand of fellowship and friendship to them. Help us to support and encourage them as they come to Largs and uh, make a new start here in the town. We seek your blessing on Hector and Susan and on their family. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with them. Uh, guard them, keep them, and help them as they come amongst us. Lord, we give you thanks for them and welcome them into our church and into our fellowship today. We give thanks now for your word and for Alistair, and we now, as he comes to preach to us, we pray that what he says might be in your name and in your will. Lord, we pray that you will be with him, support him, and strengthen him, as he brings your word to us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be with you again. Um, I'm really surprised you had me back so quickly. But it's, it's lovely to be here. Um, on my way down here, I came through a, a little town that you'll know, and there's a wee gospel hall there that I've preached in way in years gone by, and there's a big sign outside that says this, we preach Christ, 
crucified. And that's bang on. But let me challenge you and say it's not enough. I'm thinking as I, if I was not a Christian and I passed that sign, it would, number one, it would puzzle me because I didn't know why Jesus died. And I, would, I wouldn't understand too much. And sorry, this is not a criticism of this church. Please don't think about it. It just struck me this, this morning how it's important that, that we understand that the gospel is not just about Jesus dying, that the resurrection was absolutely essential. You're banging the button this morning. Thank you in your worship. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus. And, and I want to, to speak about what the resurrection means because it's absolutely vital. I grew up in a church in the south side of Glasgow, a huge church that is no more. It's over 400 members. The sign outside it was another verse from Scripture. Christ died for our sins. But that's only incomplete. That's not just the whole verse. That's not the gospel. And so... It's very, under, very important that we understand um, the absolute essential truth that Jesus Christ is alive. Paul said this, and I read from 1 Corinthians 15. Don't turn to it. Well, sorry, you can turn to it if you want. But um, I'm going to read from the message um, version of the Bible, just to give us a sort of fresh reading of this. Friends, says Paul, let me go over the message with you one final time. This message that I proclaimed and that you made your own. This message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved. I'm assuming now that your belief was the real thing and not just a passing fancy and that you're in this for good and for holding fast. The first thing I did was place before you what was placed so emphatically before me, that the Messiah, Christ, died for our sins. That's what Elam Hall had in just Victoria Road in Glasgow. Christ died for our sins. And I just wish they'd put the next bit in. Exactly as Scripture tells us, for he was buried and he was raised from death on the third day, again exactly as Scripture says, that he presented himself alive to Peter and then to his closest followers, to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. I met him, says Paul. I met the risen Christ. We have a communion service in Carchbridge every Sunday morning, and it's great to be back doing that after the, the pandemic. And we came to Easter Sunday, and it, it was a joyful service, but you know, people were singing, He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. And I'm thinking, man alive! He is alive! This guy was dead! Born dead! And he's alive. Is that not absolutely amazing? Why do we not understand that? Why does it not dawn on us that this is not just a story that makes us feel good? That it's not a fairy tale? That actually a man was dead and buried and became alive again. And that changes absolutely everything. Isn't that pure dead brilliant? And I, I just, I think it's maybe our Scottish conservatism in a small sea, um, isn't it? We don't like to show our emotions. It's a bit like, I still struggle. I like to, when I'm singing, I like to do this, but I don't like my hand too high because I'm not used to that and it, it goes against the grain. But actually, I shouldn't be ashamed to do that. If, if When Andy Murray won the 
uh, tennis open. I'm a real tennis fan. When he won the tennis open in Wimbledon, I was on my feet and with my daughter and my, my wife, and we were dancing up and down. And yet, here is something that is infinitely more important. Isn't it just, just, just enjoy it. Enjoy him. And I, the truth is, if Jesus... I'm not sure it's responding. Can you put that on for me, please? Um, if Jesus is dead, if he did not rise from the dead, then his body decayed in that tomb and will have long gone. There might be wee fragments left. There would be no meeting with the disciples. There would be no encounter with Peter on the shore that day where he was restored. Peter was restored and the Lord asked him to serve him. There would be no, I will be with you always. You guys, if you're Christian, you're on your own. You believe a story, but you're on your own if Jesus has not risen. There'd be no life after death. And when we hold our funerals and we say there is hope, that is rubbish if Jesus is not risen from the dead. And there's no way to get to God if Jesus is not risen from the dead. And there's no point in celebrating. Actually, this church would not be here. You would not be here. And there was no, there is no Holy Spirit because Jesus, when he rose from the dead, said, I'm going to the Father. If he, wasn't, if he was still dead, he wouldn't be able to go to the Father. And when I go, I'll ask him to send the Holy Spirit to you, to fill you. And there'd be no church. And there'd be no promised return. There would be no hope. No hope at all. And Paul reflects this. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised... He's just a man. He might have been a special man. He might have had some good teaching. He might have had a great following, at least at the beginning. But actually, he was just a man. And our preaching is useless, says Paul. It's a waste of time. Why do I do it? Our faith is futile. We are lost. And there is no But, he says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And let that little smile that's twitching in your lips become a big smile. Because he is alive. He is alive. And when we understand that he is alive. The resurrection of Jesus brings, and I want to focus on five things briefly this morning. It brings confirmation of who he is, his identity. It brings forgiveness and allows forgiveness and a fresh start. It brings to us supernatural power. It brings his divine presence with us, and it brings an unquenchable hope that nothing can extinguish. Christ's resurrection, first of all, brings confirmation of his identity. And Paul in Romans chapter 5 says this, the good news, now the word good news here, the gospel is as the authorized version would put it. The gospel means good news like world-shattering news, like the end of World War II. News that brings jubilation, news that couldn't be any better. News that is broadcast throughout the world. That's what this word gospel means. 
It's the best news in the world, and it comes from God. It's the news of God. Promised beforehand, says Paul, the prophets, the Old Testament writers, promised this news regarding God's Son, regarding this unique person who is God in human form, who has always existed but entered our world on that first Christmas, regarding his son, who as to his human life was a descendant of David, Jesus' physical mum. It's, it's astounding, isn't it? She bore the Son of God. Just, how, how, can, you, how can you imagine that? She bore the Son of God. He grew within her, conceived by the Holy Spirit miraculously. As to his human descent, Mary was a, a descendant of King David. And the prophets before had said, and the Lord had said to David, from you there will always be a king on the throne forever and ever. And that king is eventually Jesus. And she was a descendant of Mary and his adoptive father, Joseph, who had no part to play in the conception of Jesus, but had inverted commas was his adoptive father, was also in the line of David. So people looked at him and he was, humanly speaking, the son of Joseph and Mary. But who through the spirit of holiness, through the power of the spirit, was declared with power, with power, to be the Son of God. Why? By his resurrection from the dead. Says Paul, when Jesus rose from the dead. Have you got it? He's risen. Have you got it? Does it cheer you up this morning? By his resurrection from the dead. That confirms through the power of the Spirit that he is who he claimed to be, whom the prophet said he would be. He is the divine Son of God in human form. Jesus, Savior. Christ, Messiah, the Anointed One. Our Lord, the One above all who is and always has been and always will be the great I am. And who never changes the Lord. And through the resurrection of Jesus, that brings to us confirmation that the Jesus who died and rose again is the Son of the living God himself. Someone once said this, that a Savior, one who can save us spiritually, one who can get us to God, is the Savior who is not quite God himself, is like a bridge that is broken at the farther end. It's like us trying to take a ladder to heaven or a bridge across the, the river to get to the other side where God is. Bridge over troubled water. And no human being can get us the full distance. Only God can. I remember reading the story of a a rebel leader in the Far East who had eventually been captured and, and brought into a camp and kept there, a refugee camp. And there in that camp was a, a missionary, thousands of people in it, and he entered into conversation with this missionary and this terrorist or ex-rebel leader often, told him about Christ, and he refused to believe 
till one day he came running up to the missionary he says, and says, I believe in Jesus. And I said, what happened? He said, ah, last night I had a dream. And in my dream I was coming to a, a river and I had to cross that river and I desperately wanted to get to the other side. And there on the other side was a man in shining white. And he said, I am Jesus. Come across. And he says, I just now believe in Jesus. And the missionary says, I've been preaching you to, to you for years and you've not believed. And on the basis of one short dream, you believe. And he said, yes, but my wife had exactly the same dream last night. Jesus is alive. He's not broken at the far end. And if you're struggling to get close to God, and if you're thinking, I need help to do that, then Jesus is the one. Because he is God. And he is man. Absolutely mind-boggling stuff, but wonderful. And he can take you there. Easy peasy. Because he's alive. He is the bridge that brings us to God. And the resurrection brings confirmation of his identity. The living Son of God. The eternal one, the great I am. The resurrection secondly brings to us forgiveness and a fresh start. Do you remember, you will remember that Peter let down the Lord badly. I'm so glad Peter's in the Bible because I identify so much with him. So, so much with him. And... Um, the story is just told there boldly how badly he let the Lord down at the time when the Lord needed him more than anything. And we read in between the four Gospels that, that G Jesus met Peter several times before this encounter on the lakeside. He met them on the, on the resurrection day itself when, he was, when the disciples were in the room, door locked, and the Lord came. Didn't need to open the door, he was there. And once again, a week later, when Thomas was there, and at this time, and the Lord said, put your hand in my wounds, Thomas. I'm real. I am alive. And, and we read in 1 Corinthians 15 that the Lord appeared to Peter. So there are several encounters with Peter. We're not told of the conversations with Peter at these times, but we are in, opened up in this one when he met him on the shore of the Lake Galilee. When he had finished eating, they were having breakfast together. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I love this because he didn't say, hey, Peter, you and me have got something to sort out, haven't we? Hey, Peter. You let me down. Hey, Peter, do you feel guilty? You should. Are you sorry, Peter? What have you to say for yourself? No, no. You know, the Lord's much more gracious with us than we are with other people sometimes. We, as Christians, sometimes call people to repent. Don't read of the Lord saying to Peter, I want you to repent here. We read of the Lord with open arms and asking Peter, where do you stand in relationship to me? I asked him a question. Do you love me, Peter? And when I let the Lord down and I come back to him and I say, Lord, I've, I've blown, I have blown it again. And I have to say that happens awful frequently. He doesn't say to me, Alistair, sit in a wee corner for a wee while and, and put it right. He has done that. He says, just, he's just so glad I come back. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just, what? To forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And right at that point where I come back to him, He forgives and restores. And he said to Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, you know. 
And Jesus said, feed my sheep, feed the people that will follow me. Again, Jesus said, second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And, you know, it's obvious. Why did Jesus ask the question three times? Because Peter had three times denied he even knew this person he was speaking to. And he was hurt. He felt hurt. He was probably feeling guilty. But he was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. The Lord knows your heart. He knows my heart. He knows even when I am just such a grump or whatever it is I am at times. Such an independent stubborn soul, even although I've been following the Lord for years, make such a mess of it. Do you not find that? Not about me, but about you. And yet, he loves me, he knows all things about it. He knows all about me, and he loves me. And Jesus restored him, and he said, and Peter, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, Peter would have gone to his grave thinking, I let down my master. Now, okay, he, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, he wouldn't be the son of God. But he was still so close to Peter, and Peter was so close to him, and, and valued him so much that he would have gone to his grave feeling guilty about that. What does the Lord do? He says, oh, he does, he says Peter, you need to go to confession a few times and do a whole lot of good things before I'll let you take any responsibility in my church. No. He just says, feed my sheep. Isn't that wonderful? He just trusts us and restores us wholly completely. Oh, rejoice in that. And the resurrection makes that possible because I can speak to him this morning and say, Lord, yesterday I did that. Or even this morning, Lord, I was thinking the wrong things. Or, I, Lord, I was being critical in my spirit or whatever it was. And I can speak to him now. And it's all sorted. There's nothing more freeing than that. And if it hadn't been for the resurrection, forgiveness would not be possible. And in Romans 5 verse 10, Paul says this, If while we were God's enemies, before we even came to know God, before we were interested in Him, while we just were living our own lives, ignoring God basically, while we were in that situation, he made us his friends. He made us his friends while we were away from him. How did he do that? Through the death of his son. Christ died for our sins. And that's right. But he doesn't stop there. He says, how much more then? Now that we are his friends, he will save us. Go on to save us now, forgive us, cleanse us, change us, and one day take us to be with him forever. How? Through his son's resurrection life. And that would be impossible if Jesus did not rise from the dead. Oh, isn't that pure death brilliant? Just amazing. 
Christ's resurrection brings proof of his identity, confirms who he is. It brings and allows forgiveness, restoration, and a fresh start for each one of us. And if some of you who are following the Lord, who are Christians, have been letting him down, don't despair. Just turn to him as you would do just in prayer to say, Lord, I need you. I need your forgiveness. And he'll say, on you go. On you go. And thirdly, it brings supernatural power, the resurrection of Jesus. I pray, says Paul, in Romans 5, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, your spiritual sight may be enlightened, that you may know, that you may know and experience His, that's God's, incomparably great power, power that is beyond any other power you can ever imagine the creator power for us who believe. That power is given to us who believe. That power, says Paul, is the same as the mighty strength he exerted, God exerted, when he raised Christ from the dead. and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. The power that took Jesus to be raised from the dead, God raised him on the third day, says Paul. That same power is available to you and me. That same power is within us. And Jesus said this to his disciples, you will receive power, that same word dynamite, power, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses wherever you live. I am convinced that we don't understand this. We don't understand the power God has given us. And the power doesn't come to us in wee short bursts of 240 watts as we plug into a circuit or a battery power. It comes in the person of the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to leave you, but I will not leave you as orphans. In John 14, he talks about this, and he says, my Father will send the Spirit. And then he says, we will come to you, my Father, and I will come to you through the Comforter, the Counselor the paracletos, the one who comes alongside to help us live the lives that he asks us to live and to be changed into his image as our lives go on. The Trinity is hard to understand, Father, Son, and Spirit, but I just believe him. And and I have within me because of God's promise, not because of anything I've done, and because of Christ's death and resurrection, I have God's Spirit living within me, God within me. My body is the temple, the dwelling place of the living God. Now, that is mind-boggling. And He is my power. And I waken each day and I need Him. I need him. And I just say, Lord, I need you. And he, he's there. And that power will never run out. It's eternal. And he says, you will be my witnesses wherever you live. Notice he doesn't say, you will witness to me. He says, you will be. It's who you are. We're in the middle of an alpha course in our church, and there's a lady who's come who's a physiotherapist, and um, she works with one of the members of our church. And um, she explained that she came to the course because of the lifestyle and the way that uh, this Christian lady lived and worked with her. She says she's just different than everybody else. You will be my witness. Are you different? 
When you go into the shops and largs and you go to wait in a queue, do you get grumpy? Do you, are you thankful? To those who are helping you out, those of you guys who are driving, do you cut out in front of other people? Or if somebody cuts out in front of you and you get annoyed and, and you peep your horn or you blast your horn and you try and cut them off at the next junction, the Lord says, hey, you have to be different. I can remember my dad telling me that he got uh, came to lights in Cathcart Road in Glasgow one day, just in a very slight incline down the way. He forgot to put his handbrake on properly. Slipped forward just ever so slightly and just nudged the car in front. The car door swung open very quickly. This guy came stomping out. Oh, good morning, Andrew. One of the elders in our church or the church he belonged to, you will be my witnesses. Are you going to be different? I can't be different on my own. By nature, I'm impatient. By nature, I'm uh, downhearted, downcast. I need the Lord. And you do too. And because he's alive, it's possible. He brings supernatural power through his Holy Spirit. And the corollary of that, or just part of that, is he brings, the resurrection brings his divine presence. This same Lord said to his disciples, I will be with you wherever you go. As you train everyone you meet in this Christian way of life, as you dis disciple people, as you show them how to live by the way you live and by what you say and how you say it, day by day, day after day after day, right up to the end of the age, I will be with you. Day after day after day after day, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That is just magic. And just wonderful. And the writer to the Hebrews in the last chapter of that book says this, and here's God's say so. When you face life, when you face difficulties, God's say so is this. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Is that true? Yes, it is true because God has said it and he is faithful. And when God says that, our say so, we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Are you fearful? I'm fearful. Fearful of the future for our world, for our country, for people I know who are in real difficulties. For my own health in the future, I'm fearful. That's my nature. But the Lord says, never will I leave you, Alistair. I will never forsake you, never, ever, ever. I will always be there. I will never not be there. Always be there with you. And so I say with confidence, I say it to you, Lord, are you listening? This is God's word. The Lord is your helper. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And I think what the scriptures mean by that is when you are afraid, trust him. And even in your fear, you know he's there. And he will take you through. And finally, the resurrection of Jesus brings an unquenchable hope. It says, Paul, if Christ is in you, are you a Christian? then he is in you through his spirit. Then if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, because of sin and the decay of, that eventually brings death, even though you're facing death, the spirit, God's spirit, 
brings life because of his righteousness, what Jesus has done, making you right with him. And if the spirit of him, now this is a lovely phrase here, I love this phrase, if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead, what a picture, what a lovely description of God the Father. If the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead, what a lovely picture. If that spirit is living within you, he who raised Christ from the dead, says it again, he, that same God, the Father, will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So if you've come to believe in Christ, his spirit lives within you. And Paul says, if his spirit lives in you, God the Father who has raised Christ from the dead, even though your body is decaying and will eventually die, he will give life to your mortal bodies. Now, he's not saying to your soul here. He's saying to your bodies. You see, the resurrection of Jesus was not just that he goes on living in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our memories. The resurrection of Jesus was a physical body coming to life again, to a new physical body, the resurrection body of Jesus that was different than the pre-resurrection body of Jesus. And it was Jesus' resurrection body. And the Lord says, Christ is going to give life to your mortal body because his spirit lives within you. And I think it's in Philippians, Paul says, that a resurrection body will be like unto Jesus' glorious resurrection body. I'm looking forward to that because I could do with some changes. I was walking out from, I got the paper this morning. I'm allowed to do that on a Sunday. I got a paper this morning on Sunday. And I, I go up a small incline out of the village to our house. And I, was, I, I noticed I was getting a wee bit puffed. Breathless, that is, for you in Ayrshire, Glasgow, puffed. And I'm thinking, am I dying? I know I can't do what I used to do. And I know that one day, and it possibly won't be too long, I will be dead, physically dead. But the Lord says, hey, I'm going to give you life to this body of yours. But it's a different body. It's a resurrection body. There's a connection. Do you remember when Jesus met on the Mount of Transfiguration? He met Elijah and Moses. Do you remember that? I know you weren't there, but you know the story. How did they know it was Moses and Elijah? Did they have Facebook pages then? No? How did they know? They were recognizable. Jesus in his resurrection body just appeared. The door was shut. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. I'd love to go through a closed door. And it's a body that is eternal. It's just wonderful. And I, I, it's indescribable. It will be your body and you will be recognizable. It is a physical body. Not just, we're not just going to be ghosts that we can float through each other. Physical body, Jesus it drank. He said to Thomas, put your hand into my wounds. Touch me. Mary, who got down on her knees and hugged him tightly, he said, don't hold, don't hold on to me, Mary. Physical body, but a resurrection body. Uh, we're not given full details, I just, uh, just as well, but it will be wonderful. And Paul says this, 
since death came through a man, through Adam that is, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. At the beginning of the human race, a man called Adam and his wife Eve allowed sin to enter our world. And as a result of that, we bear the genetics, the spiritual genetics of this man and this wife Eve. And we die. As they did. But Paul says, in the same way, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man with a capital M. Through Jesus. For as in Adam, all of us die. So in Christ, all will be made alive. But each in turn. Christ, the first fruits, he's the first, just the last six, eight weeks, we've seen the bulbs come up, the daffodils, the snowdrops, and the tulips, and whatever else. And when we see one daffodil, we don't say, oh, that's the spring, uh, and that's all we're going to see. No, no, it's just the first fruit, and the blaze of color, and the trees, if you've seen them in these... As you know, in these last few days, even with the, the warm, warmer weather and the water and the, the climate that you have here, this beautiful climate, the West Coast, everything is new again. So each in turn, the first fruits. And when he comes again, and because of his resurrection, he will come again. Those who belong to him. I think it was D.L. Moody on his deathbed was speaking to his son and all of a sudden he, he brightened up. D.L. Moody, I think, had lost two children in his younger years. And he opened his eyes and he said to his son, I can see the children. I can see the children. It will be worth it all. It's an old, old hymn, isn't it? When we see Jesus. And we won't just see Jesus, we will see those who have gone before. Who are in Christ. And Paul says this again in Philippians 3. We eagerly wait a Savior from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform your lowly bodies. I've already quoted this verse. Will transform your lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious resurrection body. And it's just amazing. And so... Christ's resurrection confirms who he is. Christ's resurrection allows us to experience forgiveness, a fresh start. Christ's resurrection gives us supernatural power, the divine presence of him with us every day, every second of every day, and an unquenchable hope. The sign is in Perthshire, at the poet's walk, hope. Hope for the future. And you and I have that. Some time ago, a good friend of ours died of Alzheimer's. Early onset Alzheimer's. Both of her and her husband were Christian. And how sad is that? But yet there is hope new body, a new mind, like unto his glorious resurrection body. And without the resurrection, there is none of that. So, as Kierkegaard says, the best news of the world ever has ever heard came from a graveyard. Christ is risen. Our Redeemer lives. 
And that is the just, that sums up the gospel. Without the resurrection, nothing. Close down the church. Don't bother coming back. But if he's risen, keep coming. Encourage one another. And he has risen from the dead. May the Lord allow you to live in the light of the living Lord Jesus day by day. Amen. I, I was listening recently to a woman who had been in a concentration camp, suffered much there and person, the interviewer was asking, how, how did you survive? And she said, you can get used to anything. And it struck me at the time, you know, we can get used to the story of the resurrection and we start to take it for granted. So thanks to Alistair for reminding us today of its importance and of the implications of the resurrection for each of us here today and the hope that it brings us. Thanks to Alistair. Thanks to everyone who has taking part in the service tomorrow, uh, today and uh, who have made it possible. And thanks to you for coming. If you're listening online and you haven't been to our church, then a, a, an invitation to come along when you're able to come and to, to visit us here. We're now going to sing our last hymn and then we'll have a benediction and the service will be over. Thank you.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide on us and remain with you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for coming.